The operations presented in this video are meant to be instructional to ensure quality construction. This video is not intended to provide a comprehensive overview of safety procedures. All parties should ensure that they are familiar with and follow all safety requirements, policies, and procedures that apply to their specific operation. In this video, we are going to discuss the paving of longitudinal joints. A longitudinal joint is where two separate paving lanes join together. In many pavements, the longitudinal joint will fail before the rest of the pavement. The best performing joints will be well compacted, dense, and constructed in a way to minimize cracking or other means to allow water to enter the pavement. When placing asphalt pavements, longitudinal joints where two separate paving passes meet are often unavoidable. Following the best practices outlined in this training video should help to avoid many pitfalls and help to optimize the performance in this critical area of the pavement. If you can avoid constructing a joint, that would be the superior option. You can do this by utilizing paver extensions when practical and cost-effective to eliminate unnecessary construction of longitudinal joints. You can also do this by placing mix with two pavers in echelon. However, in many instances, this is not practical or cost-effective, and a longitudinal joint would have to be built. The following steps are the best way to ensure the joints are well constructed. Joint locations need to be planned in advance, especially on projects where there will be multiple pavement layers. Joints must be offset approximately 6 inches from the layer immediately below to avoid a plane of weakness in the pavement. When placing multiple lifts in phased work, as shown here, offsetting joints also controls loose material rolling down the edge and allows for proper screed overlap and compaction when placing abutting lanes. Next, locate surface joints. Surface joints should be at the approximate center line for two-lane roadways. For more than two-lane roadways, the joint should be within 12 inches of the lane lines. However, the joint is best slightly offset from the paint lines so that any overbanding or future crack sealing operations will not interfere with the pavement markings. Joints should not be located within a wheel path. Next, apply a tack coat at a minimum of six inches wider at the joint than the pavement to be placed. To assure a true line when paving, closely follow lines or markings placed for this purpose. Making a straight first pass is crucial in building a quality joint. When the first pass is not straight, it will be very difficult to properly pave the second lane and achieve the desired overlap, which will be discussed later. In severe instances, the lane edge should be corrected to make a straight edge that can be evenly matched when paving the second lane. When rolling at an unsupported edge, maintain an overhang of the roller drum three to six inches to avoid lateral movement of the mix. The idea behind the three to six inches is to ensure the overhang without causing substantial roll down of the mix. Overhanging more than six inches risks causing roll down at the edge. Overhanging less than three inches risks getting the drum edge even with the pavement edge, which can cause problems. It may be necessary to compact a platform before overhanging on deep courses like base or on steeply super elevated sections. Building some support first can help prevent the edge from rolling down. Getting the roller edge even with the pavement edge can cause lateral movement or breaking over of the mix at the edge. This can cause loose mix particles to roll down over the edge where no compaction will occur. If the edge of the drum of a steel wheel roller, operated in either the vibratory or static mode, is just inside the unsupported edge of the pavement lane, two things may happen. One, the mix has a tendency to widen out, to move in transverse direction, especially tender mixes. Lateral movement is also reduced by a good bond, such as a good tack or milled surface. Secondly, a crack may form at the place where the edge of the drum passed when it falls near an unsupported edge. Due to these reasons, compacting with the drum edge inside unsupported edges is not a good practice. This illustrates why rolling just inside of the edge is not desirable. This mix had a tender zone and cracks formed at the edge of the roller drum. This is another example of cracking at the edge where the roller drum was too close. 
It should be noted that these are extreme examples, and just because a crack cannot be seen as the construction occurs does not mean that a crack will not develop at the stress location in the future. Once construction of the first pass is complete, paint the entire area of the joint with a uniform coating of either the liquid binder used in the mix or PG64-22. This additional asphalt at the joint helps to bond the two layers together and fills potential voids at the joint interface. Carefully make a thin, even application along the joint. For notched wedge joints, this will mean painting the full surface of the notch and wedge. Consistent, proper overlap is key to performance. Once the first lane has been placed and the joint is painted, the second lane is ready to be placed. Operate paver so that the edger plate on the screed overlaps the previously placed pavement by approximately one inch or up to one and a half inches. Periodically check to ensure the overlap is on target. Now we are going to talk about what we don't want to see. This shows a pavement core taken at the longitudinal joint. This core was 85% density and had an obvious line of voids along the joint interface area. The material was not pushed tightly into the joint by the paver screed. Maintaining a proper overlap will help ensure that the paver screed properly forces material into the joint. Excessive overlap should be removed and not enough overlap starves the joint of material. You are looking at the underneath side of two joint cores placed on the same day with the same mix. The tops of the cores really looked the same and showed no major differences. The core on the left was made by paving a joint on a milled surface with no overlap, trying to match the edge of the previously placed lane. The core on the right was taken after changing to a consistent one inch overlap, which in turn made sure that sufficient material was present at the joint. You can see the difference that was made in overlapping the mix. This is what we do want. Paver augers should push the mix up tightly against free face of the joint. It is important to extend the augers when screed extensions are installed to ensure that there is not too much gap between the edge of the augers and the joint, and to keep the material about the mid height of the augers. If the gap between the augers and the end gate is too large, then often the material is not pushed into the joint, but can fall or roll down, resulting in more coarse, loose mix at the joint. Make sure that the mix does not roll down to the edge plate, and the edge plate should be relatively tight to the pavement. Do not push material away from the joint, otherwise known as bumping back the joint. This applies for all size mixes, including base mix, but make sure the overlap is not excessive. This works well if the overlap is not excessive. If overlap is excessive and causes poor results on large aggregate mixes, remove excess material and adjust operations to eliminate excessive overlap, but maintain the specified overlap. When compacted, the material may have a thin white crush line. It is critical to make sure the second lane has sufficient depth of material to allow for full density during compaction activities. If the mix is not placed deep enough, once the roller makes a few passes over the joint, the weight of the roller will transfer to the first lane and the mix will not fully compact. The typical mix compacts a quarter inch for each inch of depth. So for one and a half inch wearing course, the mix should typically be kept at at least three eighths of an inch higher than the adjacent lane prior to rolling. This can vary depending on the initial density coming out from under the paver screed. If the joint is starved of material, the roller weight will bridge onto the cold mat and joint density will be poor. To avoid this, where practical, set automated controls to function as joint matchers when paving between traveled lanes. Maintain the proper depth at the joint. Now we're going to discuss mat compaction. For most applications, best results are achieved when rolling the mat from the unsupported edge to the longitudinal joint. This method attempts to minimize lateral movement of the mix at the unsupported edge and allows any lateral movement of the mix to travel towards the confinement at the joint. Any extra material will be compacted when rolling gets to the joint area. For compaction at a vertical joint, as rolling approaches the joint on the roller's forward pass toward the paver, leave 6 to 12 inches uncompacted as shown above.
As the roller then moves away from the paver, slightly overlap the joint by two to six inches. After the first pass, all subsequent roller passes at the joint should overlap the joint. It is important that the joint receives at least as many roller passes as the rest of the pavement. For compaction at a notched wedge joint, as rolling approaches the joint on the roller's forward pass toward the paver, leave approximately 18 inches uncompacted as shown above. The reason to keep the roller further back on the notched wedge joint is to avoid the edge of the roller being directly over the bottom of the wedge, which is approximately 12 inches wide. As the roller then moves away from the paver, slightly overlap the joint by 2 to 6 inches. After the first pass, all subsequent roller passes at the joint should overlap the joint. It is important that the joint receives at least as many roller passes as the rest of the pavement. Compaction at the joint. In this photo, this roller can be seen compacting away from the paver after leaving approximately 18 inches uncompact on a notched wedge joint. The mat has already been compacted from the unsupported edge toward the joint. The pass the roller is making is overlapped approximately 6 inches onto the cold side of the joint, and all subsequent passes on the joint will be made overlapping the joint. One very critical item when compacting materials at the joint is to ensure that there are an adequate number of roller passes. Just rolling the joint a few times may make it look cosmetically okay, but achieving the best density will help to assure the joint performs as intended throughout the pavement life. Good density makes the pavement much less permeable and as such will lead to better service life. Some final points to remember. Eliminate joints when possible. Plan ahead where joints will be located. Tack beyond the edge and pave straight. Overhang roller drums at unsupported edges. Coat the joint with liquid PG binder and ensure a proper overlap of previous lanes by approximately one inch. Pave mix deep enough to account for roll down during compaction and use a joint matcher. Roll the joint making at least as many passes as the rest of the mat. Following these simple steps will maximize the performance of the longitudinal joints.